Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today as we are talking about um, Harriet Buss and uh, this book, My Work Among the Freedmen. Um, as Sabrina said, my name is Lydia Hester. Um, this book was published under my maiden name, but I promise I am the same person. Um, and I'm currently serving um, as a history educator here at the museum. Um, and I'm really excited to share this project with you. Um, but before we kind of jump into who Harriet Buss was and what she did and her legacy in Hampton Roads, uh, we have to really contextualize um, her in this broader understanding of um, African Americans, um, formerly enslaved people, and their relationship to education. Um, looking back on their years in bondage, uh, when elderly African Americans were interviewed, they recalled great links that they had gone to to get an education um, because enslaved people who were educated were considered a liability. They were dangerous um, to Southern whites as they could potentially breed discontent among the enslaved population. Um, enslaved people who attempted to learn to read and write uh, risked severe punishment and violence um, for them and their families as well. Nevertheless, by 1860, between five and 10% of enslaved people enslaved people had learned how to read. Um, and this population had found lots of ways to do this. Um, some like Frederick Douglass had tricked white children to teach them how to read and write. Um, others taught each other in makeshift schools in the woods at night. Um, African-Americans understood education to be part of the key to becoming full participants in society and a gateway to their own freedom. Uh, therefore, gaining an education at all costs was a priority to them um, prior to the Civil War, during the war, and in the post-war period. Um, and the inception of the Civil War created new opportunities for Black Southerners to gain an education. Um, as Union forces moved through the South, uh, white slave owners fled, leaving behind um, enslaved African Americans um, who would then become free. These freed men or freed people, as we uh, tend to refer to uh, this population, uh, they showed a tremendous initiative when it came to uh, gaining education. Um, they set up what is sometimes referred to as native schools um, throughout the entire South. And by 1866, at least 500 of these institutions who were run by um, formerly enslaved people were in operation. Um, but Northerners also played a role in uh, education for freed men and women. Um, as the Confederates lost more and more control of territory during the Civil War, uh, both the U.S. government and Northern philanthropic societies moved into the South to establish aid societies and a relief for these people, um, as well as schools um, for, for this population. Um, and so here we have pictures of some of the schools that were established um, during this period. Okay. So through the Northern Aid and Philanthropic Societies, Northern missionaries volunteered to move to the South um, to staff these schools. Um, and a lot can be said about their broader motivations um, that they had when they were coming to the South to staff these schools, both positive and negative. There is a lot of scholarship on that, um, as well as the efficacy and the larger impact that these Northern missionaries had on this population and on the region um, during the Civil War and in the Reconstruction period. Um, today, I won't be diving too deeply into their broader motivations, although it's definitely worth discussing, and that is discussed in the book. Um, rather, today I'm going to be talking really specifically about Harriet Buss, um, her motivations, and kind of how her perspective changes throughout her career as a teacher of freedmen. Um, but I will talk generally about these teachers of freedmen, uh, their reputation um, has seen a lot of shifts in historic scholarship. Um, traditionally, uh, scholars view these teachers of freedmen as the New England school ma'am. Uh, and you can see kind of this picture on the left of this idealistic kind of romanticized woman um, who is teaching, teaching freedmen in the South. Um, can I dropped my uh, clicker, but it's okay. Um, and even W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, um, wrote about these women. And he said, quote, rich and poor they were, 
serious and curious, they came seeking a life work in planting New England schoolhouses among the white and the black of the South. They did their work well, end quote. So there was this kind of romanticization of these women um, as they are moving down. Um, and there was kind of this stereotype of, thank you, um, young, wealthy, attractive um, teachers coming down, kind of this like, um, missionary zeal. Um, but then throughout the 20th century, the reputation of what then became called the Yankee School Marm um, saw a decline. Um, historians of the Dunning School, which was a group of um, historians who had a similar kind of thought, they loathed the quote messianic invasion of the South um, by what they saw as intolerant and often corrupt radicals. Um, one denigrated them as, quote, horse-faced, bespectacled, and spare of frame. Um, and more recent scholars have criticized these Northern white teachers from the opposite perspective, arguing that they were not racially enlightened enough. Um, and so just from that brief overview, you can see that there have been multiple shifts in how these teachers are viewed. Um, and we could go very deeply into that topic. Um, but we did do some research on, you know, how much of these stereotypes is accurate based on the records that we have um, of uh, these teachers. And from Dr. White and I's, Dr. White and I's research, uh, we see that the stereotype of the white, young, female, wealthy teacher from New England was not actually the typical uh, teacher of freedmen in the South um, at all. Um, most Northern teachers, they came from the middle or Western states, not typically New England. Um, and moreover, a third of the teachers in Freedmen schools were African-American during this time, both Northern and Southern. Um, roughly half of the teachers were actually from the South. Some were even ex-Confederate soldiers and Southerners who needed income in the post-war post -war period. Um, few of the Northern women were wealthy. Uh, most of them weren't even young. M more of them were single older women. Uh, most were middle class and they needed funding in order to go to the South. So a lot of them received funding from missionary societies. Um, the ones who came from the North did. Um, they were high re highly religious um, and a lot of them came with a, a religious zeal um, and they prioritized spreading their denomination of Christianity among the South. Um, over time, however, so this kind of had its boom during the Civil War period and the immediate Reconstruction period. Over time, though, the number of white Northern teachers really declines in the South. Um, and by 1870, white Southerners outnumbered white Northerners in classrooms uh, for Black students. Um, so that gives you kind of a context into uh, the broader picture of teachers for freedmen um, in the South during this period. So now we can introduce Harriet Buss, um, also known as Hattie. That is how she signs all of her letters. Um, and we don't know a ton about her early life. Uh, we know she was born in Sterling, Massachusetts in 1826 uh, to her parents, Silas and Sally Buss. Uh, she grew up on a farm. And in her late teens and early 20s, um, she starts attending schools to become a teacher. She attends the Charlestown Female Seminary and the Fitchburg Teachers Institute. Um, and she writes in her letters, she has this passion from a young age to be a teacher. This really is her life's work. Um, and she really wants to teach. Um, and she starts writing letters in the 1850s when she is in school to her parents. Um, and she writes faithfully to Silas and Sally Buss uh, for uh, the rest of their lives. And so this is where we get um, so much information about her experiences. Um, and in these immediate letters that we have in the collection, uh, when she is um, more in her you know, 20s and 30s, we start to see her personality um, really emerge, um, which was really great in setting up this book. Um, she was an, a very ambitious woman. She was a very hard worker, um, and she pursued her goals with this all or nothing uh, mentality. Um, in one letter written to her parents in 1850, she told them that she typically stayed awake past 11 p.m., um, and she was also often up before 4 a.m. to get her work done to do her student teaching. Um, so she was a single woman. She was single all of her life. And to her, working hard was a way to prosper, to gain independence. Um, and doing well in school would enable her to really make something for herself and to leave a legacy. Um, she was really passionate about 
um, leaving a legacy. She did not want to be just left to uh, left to time uh, to be forgotten. Um, and also in 1850, she wrote to her parents that, quote, I shall study my lifetime. Something or nothing is yet my motto. I will have no halfway ground. If life and health are continued, the world shall know that I live in it and future ages shall know that I have lived in it for I will leave my impress deeply traced upon it." End quote. Um, so you kind of get this sense that she is a very headstrong woman. She, um, it's really fun to read her letters, especially talking about her singleness. She's very confident um, and she wants to make a difference in the world. Um, so we set that up in the 1850s, um, which really paints a picture of the rest of her life. Um, so once she graduates from school, she teaches in uh, New England for a while. Uh, she moves to Illinois and teaching in schools. Um, but about a year after the Civil War commences, we start to see in her letters her view on national politics and kind of how she's feeling about um, what's happening. Uh, she does not present herself necessarily as an abolitionist. We don't really see that coming through in her letters. Uh, but we do see that she begins to express a desire to teach formerly enslaved people. Um, as, I said, as I said, the Union moves through the South and kind of starts to gain more control of this area um, to set up um, aid societies where people are starting to move down to teach. And she expresses the desire to do this. Um, she wrote that, quote, uh, she wanted to find a field where she could be engaged, fitting as large a class as possible for thorough and efficient Christian teachers of their own race. Um, and then the autumn of 1862, she was hoping to find an appointment uh, to teach Black refugees in Washington, D.C., um, but didn't get an opportunity to do that. Um, and then in the spring of 1863, uh, she has, gets the opportunity to move to South Carolina, uh, where there has already been since 1861, uh, a Northern presence there after the Union occupies Port Royal, uh, South Carolina. Um, so she sails to Beaufort, uh, South Carolina in March of 1863. Um, there we go. Um, and she works in Beaufort with rural, isolated, multi-generational, uh, formerly enslaved people who were caught up in the immediate friction and abrasion of the Civil War. Um, and she lives in the Mission House in Beaufort, South Carolina. And on the far left, you can see uh, Dr. White and I actually got to go see the Mission House. That is, it's still standing. It's where she lived, uh, which was really cool. Um, and she writes from this house that she's able to actually hear the bombardment of Charleston at this point. Um, and she gets to meet a lot of really cool people, a lot of really notable figures of the Civil War, um, including Colonel James Montgomery of Bleeding Kansas fame, um, Colonel Thomas Wentworth Hig uh, Higginson, um, and the Union General Rufus Saxton, um, as well as uh, Underground Railroad conductor Harriet Tubman. She actually meets her, which kind of blew my mind when Harriet meets Harriet in, um, in this book. Um, she also gets the opportunity to meet and have a really meaningful relationship with Robert Smalls, um, who was a really famous formerly enslaved person. He later becomes a congressman. Um, she also uh, builds relationships with his wife and teaches their children. Um, so it's really cool to read about that. Uh, when she moves to Beaufort, she's initially really taken aback by um, the disposition of her students. Um, she has a hard time adjusting, and it's in this period where you do see that initial um, kind of missionary perspective that she has when she's teaching uh, these children, uh, but she kind of grows in her confidence um, in her abilities as a teacher in this really new um, situation. So she returns home to Massachusetts um, after about a year. Uh, then she returns back to South Carolina. And this time uh, she's working with the National Freedmen's Relief Association. Um, and they place her in charge of a school um, on Hilton Head Island on the Joe Pope Plantation. Um, and you can see the middle picture here is uh, what the plantation house looked like uh, for the Joe Pope Plantation. And this is one of those plantations where the Union Army, Army had come in. Uh, the owners of the plantation left and left everything there. Um, and so Harriet moves in to this house and she's the only woman there. Um, and she establishes a school there for the people who were left on this plantation. Um, and so 
these letters really show that um, it's like an isolated experience where she's really building relationships with uh, the people she's working with, um, both adults and children. Uh, we don't have a ton of letters from this period. Uh, her last surviving letter that we have is dated January of 1864, but we were able to figure out she becomes very sick while she's in South Carolina and she returns home to Massachusetts um, to recuperate. And she remains in Massachusetts from 1864 through the remainder of the war. Um, and then she teaches a little while in the North. She teaches in Massachusetts and uh, different schools there. Um, but she's obviously really dissatisfied through her letters and is really anxious to return to the South to what seems to kind of have grown into her, her passion, um, which is teaching freed people. Um, so in 1868, so a few years later, um, she's ready to return to the South. On January 15th, she wrote to a man with the American Missionary Association, informing him that the people in her hometown are starting to raise money for her to return uh, to the South. Um, she didn't want to go back to South Carolina because she had gotten so sick, um, but she's hoping for, again, a placement in Washington, D.C., um, and she explained, quote, I have never abandoned the hope of again laboring among this people. I am willing and anxious to enter the work again. My term in this place is drawing to a close. Um, and if I am not sent among the freedmen, I shall pro probably continue teaching here. So she's really wanting to gain funding to return back to the South. Um, she does not receive uh, placement in Washington, D.C. Instead, she gets sent to Norfolk, um, and she's working in a school funded by the American Missionary S Association, um, supporting a Freedmen's Bureau school. Um, so a little bit of background on the Freedmen's Bureau and uh, its um, impact in Hampton Roads and Norfolk specifically. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau is a shortened version of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. So this was designed um, in 1865 to assist both the white and black refugees in the South in the Reconstruction period. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau was a pretty short-lived um, effort by the U.S. government, um, but it did play a substantial role in creating the nation's system of historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, as they are commonly called. Um, and by 1869, the Freedmen's Bureau did establish nearly 3,000 schools in the South, and that does not include uh, the schools that were established by missionary associations. So they did do a lot of work in kind of laying the groundwork for um, further education for um, Black Southerners in this period. Um, so Harriet moves to Norfolk. Um, she lives in a um, mission house where it's kind of like a boarding house for teachers. Um, it's on Freemason Street in Norfolk. So you can actually go see um, where that used to be located. It's number five Freemason Street in Norfolk. Um, and she teaches at the Cone School, which is um, an institution that had been established in 1863 by um, a missionary named William Cone. Um, and he later served as the superintendent for the schools for African Americans in Norfolk. Um, the school was originally a Baptist church, and it quickly outgrew that. Um, and they um, moved it into a school that used to be for um, white children in Norfolk. Uh, by 1864, the school had 564 students enrolled in it, um, and then 681 students who were coming for night classes. And the ages of their students, and I love this, ranged from four to 61. Um, so I think this shows that in this period of the Civil War and all this upheaval in the South, um, African Americans and formerly enslaved people are um, realizing that they ha are having this opportunity to gain an education, and they're taking that opportunity. Um, just the sheer number of people um, that are attending the school that we have records of, um, and the range of ages all the way from four to 61, uh, which I think is which is really uh, fascinating and fantastic. So Harriet taught in the high school of the Cone School, um, and she might, makes uh, monthly reports back to the American Missionary Association that is funding her work. Um, and these monthly reports give us a great idea of uh, the types of students she's teaching and what she's teaching them and kind of their retention rates as well. Um, so that was um, great fodder for our research um, of Norfolk in this period. So in 1868, um, she reported that she had 20 male students and 28 female students, um, and 13 of those were over 16. 
Um, 30 of her students attended morning class, 23 in the afternoon. Um, she also taught a night school. Um, and the night school was her normal school. And the normal school was for students who were training to become teachers. Um, so she is uh, advancing this passion that she had mentioned earlier of wanting to equip um, the African American population to become teachers themselves so that they could continue um, educating others. So she's doing that at night. Um, and in her first monthly report, she listed that all of her 48 students as advanced and 24 were starting to learn to write. Um, and one of the questions on the monthly report form um, is asking how many of her students she believed were free before the war and how many of them were formerly enslaved. And she notates that um, none of her students were free before the war. So these were all people who were formerly enslaved who are now attending the school. Um, in addition to teaching um, during the week in the Cone School during the day and at night, she also teaches Sunday school. She had 134 students in the Sabbath school at First Baptist Church on Catherine Street in Norfolk, which was pastored by a man named Thomas Henson. Uh, and the Sabbath school even grew um, during her time in Norfolk. Um, by 1869, she had 150 students and 11 teachers um, at this church. Um, Harriet's letters in Norfolk show a really different setting than where she was before. So she's in a much more urban setting, uh, which was quite different from being very isolated on Hilton Head Island. Um, and she's really involved with her school. She's really involved with her church. She's really, really close to her uh, fellow teachers, this group of women who are living in the boarding house. She refers to them as her family circle. Um, interestingly enough, she paints a very negative picture of uh, the white culture of Norfolk and kind of um, the, the population that she sees there. Um, and she says that there's very little interaction between the white Southerners and the white Northerners that have come down. Um, but the way she writes about it, she's very content to leave it that way. Um, she honestly would just rather not bother with them at all. Um, she wrote in a letter that quote, we, which is the group of teachers, uh, do not have any Southern society at all, but we are vain enough to believe our own is the best to be found, and we are quite contented therewith. I don't think many lively circle, livelier circles than ours are to be found, especially when we nine are all together. We have the acquaintance of the few Northerners in Norfolk, and our time is so well occupied that we scarcely, scarcely miss general society. Um, I suppose nearly all the people in the city know where we live and recognize our group or its individual members as we traverse the streets. And I presume they feel vastly above us, but I could most decidedly inform them that I feel as far above the whole of them as they could possibly feel above any of us. Um, so she definitely looks very negatively upon um, the white Southerners in Norfolk. She talks about uh, that they drink too much um, and their political views are, she thinks they are just all over the place. Um, she writes very, very negatively about them. Um, and here's, you see kind of her, um, more of her personality, more of her views coming forth about um, alcohol, about um, Catholics, very interestingly enough. Um, she is very anti-Catholic and writes a lot about that and how she um, is wary of her students um, being influenced by Roman Catholicism, how she wants to protect them from that. Um, so we see a lot of um, her opinions about that, especially in Norfolk, come through in these letters. Um, she presumably stays there for a pretty short period of time. Um, she returns back to Massachusetts in the summer of 1869, um, which a lot of the Northern teachers did when uh, the summer comes. And as those of us in Hampton Roads know, it is hot and humid in the summer um, down here. So most of them go back North during the summer. Um, and then when she goes back, she decides to move somewhere else. So she only stays in Norfolk for a short period of time. Uh, she moves to Raleigh, North Carolina uh, to help teach at a um, new institution, which is called the Raleigh Baptist Institute. Um, and this was a seminary for young Black men who wanted to be preachers. So she um, moves there. 
And this is um, her last position. Um, and um, Harry Bus loves this place where she moves. She loves her students. Um, she loves uh, the leaders of this institution. Um, and these letters really reveal how she grows to have this genuine deep affection and relationships with her students. And she really lives in community with black men and women. Um, and you see that start to develop in Norfolk, but that's really shown in her letters from Raleigh. Um, despite the pressures of living um, surrounded by really hostile ex-Confederates in this period, she does write about the threat of the uh, Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina um, against the, um, the seminary there. Um, she found her work to be really less taxing than what she was doing before. Um, she loves working with the adult men. Um, she says they're polite and respectful. They're highly intelligent and interested in learning. Um, she loves being involved with their church services. Um, and the Raleigh Baptist Institute, um, this later becomes the Shaw Collegiate Institute and then eventually Shaw University, uh, one of the earliest HBCUs in um, North Carolina. Um, and so she records many conversations and encounters with these students, and she really offers this on the ground perspective of the founding of this important HBCU. Um, our letters from Harriet, they continue until 1871. So from 1869 to 1871, we uh, learn about her time at the Raleigh Baptist Institute. Um, in 1871, her father dies in Massachusetts. Um, and her letters stop, presumably because she stops writing to them. Um, she moves back to Massachusetts. And we kind of lose track of her at that point um, until her mother passes away in 1887. Um, and at this point, after her mother passes away, Harriet returns to Shaw University and she teaches there until her death in 1895. Um, and she is seen as a very beloved teacher. She leaves a lot of money when she dies to Shaw University um, to kind of start a fund there. Um, I think I have. Here we go, some pictures from Shaw University. So in many ways, Harriet Buss, she does represent this typical New England um, school teacher. She was a white, educated, middle-class woman. Um, she travels from Massachusetts to the South to teach uh, formerly enslaved people. Um, and several times she does call herself uh, the Yankee school marm or um, their school ma'am. Um, but she uh, is very different than I think what we think about as the typical um, New England school teacher. She does spend a lot more time in the South than was typical for Northern teachers. Most of the women who traveled to the South, they would stay an average about two and a half years before they were fatigued, they got sick, they gave up and they go back North. Um, Harriet keeps coming back and we see that as she starts in Beaufort, she comes back to Hilton Head, she goes back to Norfolk, she goes back to Raleigh multiple times throughout her life. Um, so she has this commitment that is very different than the other, her other peers and colleagues. Um, but also interestingly enough, her perspectives really evolve as the result of her experiences. Um, and that's hard to quantify in this short talk, but in the book and her letters, you really see her perspective evolve. Um, when she initially travels down to South Carolina in 1863, she does have this um, not quite white savior mentality, but a very um, missionary perspective when she's talking about her students. Um, and she talks about wanting to elevate them um, and teach them. She calls herself a pioneer. Um, and she writes about her students in ways that do suggest she feels very culturally removed from them. Um, but over time, she sees herself as kind of having a shared mission. It's not just her coming down. Um, it is a shared mission with her students. Um, and she believed that the most important thing that she could do was to train um, her students and to train up the next generation of Black teachers and ministers. Um, and she wrote, quote, the longer I am engaged in this work, the more do I find to convince me that the great masses of this people are to be reached and elevated by the efforts of well-trained theologians and teachers of their own race. Um, and her later correspondence reveals a genuine desire to empower her students as well to uh, learn self-control, to improve their own life circumstances. Um, and she compares her students really favorably to her um, former white students in the North. And um, she writes a lot about wanting them to become leaders among themselves. Um, and this is a phrase that she uses 
quite often in her letters, um, a leader, leaders among them. Um, but more than just the shared mission, uh, Bus also has really meaningful relationships with her students. Um, and her letters reveal how she has this genuine deep affection for the individuals that she taught and that she really does live in community um, with her students. Um, so she's really set apart, I think, from the majority of the white teachers for African Americans during the Civil War. Um, and I think this is very reinforced by her decision to return to Shaw University at the end of her life, because um, she is more advanced in years in 1887, um, but she spends the last years of her life um, committing to, to teaching at Shaw University. Um, and her letters are significant for a variety of reasons um, because of their geographical and chronological reach starting in the 1850s all the way to the 1870s, um, as well as the vast different places that she taught. Um, they're unlike any other modern edition of private correspondence that we have um, published by a teacher of freed people. Um, her long and varied experiences in the South um, were uncommon for a woman in the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, and the fact that she teaches in so many different places and so many different types of students um, really give us a great understanding of uh, different places during um, this period and kind of how um, one person in particular, their perspective evolves um, over time. Um, and it offers a broad view of the Civil War era, um, social history of teachers and teaching. Um, and more than that, she also, we get this really fun sense of um, herself and I really enjoyed uh, seeing her development over these years. Um, you really just kind of like rooting for her as she is um, kind of just learning and um, teaching all these people. Um, and again, whereas other teachers grew fatigued and lasted only a short time, um, she kept coming back. Um, they also reveal a great deal about how she thought of herself as a single woman in a very male dominated society um, and how she wanted to have control over her life and her classroom. Um, she wrote that she quoted, uh, or she wanted to be quote, a woman who teaches to bless the world to make it better and to help save her country from ruin and was quote, willing to work in hard fields and far from home too. So she wrote that in 1854. Um, and throughout her life, we, we see her do that to accomplish the work that she set out to do um, and to really advance the leaders that she was hoping to, um, to advance. And we see the people who are graduating from Shaw University, they do um, become these leaders in their fields. Um, and she was able to help establish that. So thank you so much for listening to a very brief whirlwind history of Harriet Buss, um, as well as um, the education of freedmen um, during the Civil War and after the Civil War. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you so much, Lydia. And I think that um, one of the cool things that I learned was, and, and also a question is, do you think that there was a, presumably there was a race aside, culture aside, is it because in that time women in education just was unknown? So maybe there was some sympathetic understanding of how important education is mm -hmm. for all kind of peoples, maybe, is yeah. that maybe that relationship why we see so many white women educating mm -hmm. those freedmen because of, you know, the, the dynamic between women and education as well. Yeah. No, I definitely see that where we have a lot of women coming down. Um, there are men as well, but the majority are women mm -hmm. who are coming down to teach and they seem to have that that relationship as they're teaching as well. Awesome. Well, online today, we have okay. Sherry as our moderator. And um, are there any questions in the Q&A box? Hi, everybody. Yes, we do have one question. And that is, how were her letters discovered? How were her letters discovered? So uh, Jonathan White, who is the co-editor of this book, he found these letters um, in the University of Pennsylvania archives. They were in a set, but they had never been um, fully transcribed. So um, he found them. Um, I don't remember exactly when he found them, uh, but then reached out to me to be the co-editor for this project. Um, and I think from his quick glimpses at them, realized that this was a project that would be really fruitful um, because, as I said, her geographic and chronological reach. All right, and now we do have another question from Alan. Uh, is the Mission House in Beaufort the same as the McKee Smalls House? Oh, I can go back to the picture of that one. 
I don't know. I don't believe so because this is currently um, a bed and breakfast that exists in Buford that you can stay in. But I think the McKee Small South is that, I believe that's where Robert Smalls mm-hmm. lived. And this is not where he lived. He lived separately with his family in Buford. Um, so she lived in a different place. Okay. They, they do look similar from the presentation that we did a couple of uh, mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah, on Robert Smalls. Yes. Okay, any other questions to my online audience? Going once, twice. Okay, thank you for adding your questions. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we thank everybody for joining us today. Feel free to take a look at marinersmuseum.org to learn a little bit more about our upcoming lecture series. Um, And we thank you guys for joining us today and have a great weekend. Thank you.